Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wesexpress.com. Also, by the great Sherlock Holmes debate and the art of Sherlock Holmes happening live on May 25th. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 168, A Holmes by Any Other Name. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strong In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jacket office. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger streeter regulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, hi, and welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And if I were to know you by any name other than Bert Walder, what do you suppose <laughs> that might be? What's, what's the alias I could find you as? Uli Ahmed Mohammed El Raizuli the Magnificent, Sultan to the Berbers. Well, it's easy for you to say. Well, I'll just I'll just uh, jot that right down and put it on my social security card, and I'll need you to send over your social security number as well. Oh, I did that already. <laughs> now, do you know what that's a reference to? No, that, uh, clearly I'm uh, out of it. Here. That's I think that's from The Wind and the Lion, where Sean Connery played this um, desert renegade who winds up kidnapping, I think, if I'm thinking about the right picture, Cat Candace Bergen. Hmm. That sounds about right. Yeah. Candace Bergen, Brian Keith, John Houston. Yeah. Maybe I should have said something else. Maybe my <laughs> alias should have been, you know, just plain Dave. <laughs> well then you would have been you would have been outed right away, Dave. Uh, oh, that's true. Well, we are here not under aliases, but under our own power, and we're going to be talking with Bill Mason in just a moment about one of his books. Well, actually, two of his books, but particularly about the one uh, whose title you heard in the name of the episode. Before we get to that, wanted to make sure you knew where to leave your comments. Uh, the show notes are available at ihose.co slash ihose168, or just swipe across the image you see on whatever podcatcher you're using on a mobile device. Show notes should come up there. You can leave us a comment there, as we said, or you can email us at comment at ihearofsherlock.com. You can reach us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We are I Hear of Sherlock in all of those places. And you can call us at 774-221-READ. That's 774-221-7323. We'd love to hear what you have to say, and we certainly want to hear from you later on in the show when it's time to take the Canonical Couplets quiz. It'll be your chance to win a prize, and we've got a bonus contest. If you listen closely in the interview with Bill, we've got an additional contest that you'll be hearing about. Stay tuned for that. Here in the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex, we are looking forward to Whitsuntide, when we remember King Arthur's glorious coronation and the strange adventures that came before him at the High Feast of Pentecost. But you have strange adventures aplenty, thanks to your copy of The Illustrated Speckled Band, the original 1910 stage production, in scripts and photographs, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, edited by Leslie S. Klinger. 
For the first time ever, Conan Doyle's own script is published with long-lost photographs from the original production, scene by scene. Ours is that wine, that water, clear and cool, that very vineyard, and the peaceful pool. Make merry in the month of May, with the pleasure only a volume from the Wessex Press can provide. Choose yours today. Well, Bill Mason has been an enthusiastic Sherlockian since his early days when his mother gave him a copy of the Whitman's Classics Edition of the Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And he'll tell us all about that in just a moment. Bill is the founder and president of the Fresh Rashers of Nashville, a breakfast-oriented Sherlockian society. And he's a member of the Nashville Scholars of the Three-Pipe Problem. He spent a career in public service as a top-level staff member in the U.S. House of Representatives, the U.S. Senate, the White House, and the Tennessee State Capitol. And he lives in Greenbrier, Tennessee. Bill Mason, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here and excited to be here. Excellent. And, you know, we should also note that since that biography was written, you are also a a full-fledged member of the Baker Street Irregulars. Also an exciting thing to happen <laughs> for any of us, as you both know. And, uh, yes, that's happened. And the same month that happened, I was made a master bootmaker by the uh, bootmakers of Toronto. Wow. So it, it was that's an exciting year for me. That's quite, quite, quite accomplished. So what is your uh, investiture? White Mason. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, it's never been granted before as an investiture. And uh, as Mike Whelan said, when he announced it, he said uh, the, the initials are as went with it as well, because William Mason and White Mason have the same initials. It's there a, you go. It's and, a very wonderful name to have. And, and are you a Freemason? No, I am not that. Wait, <laughs> you better add that to the roster. <laughs> Maybe I should. Maybe I should. Well, do you ever read the mystery novels about Perry Mason? <laughs> yes, I love Perry Mason, and my father was an attorney and uh, uh. went through Vanderbilt Law School on the GI Bill after World War II and came out, and he uh, uh, looked a little bit like Raymond Burr and uh, set up his law practice, and Perry Mason was a great help to his success in the field of law. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> Have you had any masonry work done around the house recently? <laughs> <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, we're looking for a mason for we've got a crumbling patio, so we, we're looking for a mason to do that. So oh, we, we, we touch bases with all the mason uh, motifs in society. I, I think I think that was an Earl Stanley Gardner original. It was Perry Mason and the case of the crumbling patio? <laughs> well, I wish you could solve this one for us. <laughs> yeah. Well, wow. Well, I think we've tested the resolve of our listeners uh, far enough in this regard. Why don't we get to what we're here for and have you, have you tell us about the first time you encountered Sherlock Holmes? It was, as you mentioned earlier, my mother was a, a school teacher. She taught English and, and French in high school and she, when I was 13, gave me a copy of the Whitman Classics edition of uh, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, which I have a big collection now, but that's the most important item in it to me. Mm. And since then, I was I was just hooked. I just loved the stories, reread them, found the other ones, and uh, have been a Sherlockian since that time. And do any of the the stories pop out to you as you think back? Like, do, you, do you remember the very first story that you wrote, uh, that, that you read in that Whitman's uh, edition? Uh, I think that, yes, I do. I think it was, it was a, a scandal. It was scandal in Bohemia. Ah. And uh, uh, it was uh, uh, the very first story in the book. So that was the first one I read. I, I've always read a book from cover to cover. If I start one, I don't. Fin- I always finish it. I never fail to finish, and and that was the first one. But all of those and the whole atmosphere of it, as you know, is so important to us. And I think that's what hooked me on those stories. Hmm. And about about how old were you? I was thirteen. Thirteen. 
hmm. back in 1960. Sure. So it was a long time ago. But uh, it was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what else were you? Long, what else? Association. Yeah. What else were you reading around that time? Sounds like you were always a big reader. Uh, yes, and, and my mother loved that because uh, we were. Uh, I was a big reader, and she wanted me to read, and she wanted all of us to read. But I think of the of three three of us. I have two brothers. I was the one that that loved it the most. I like I liked the classics. Uh, I like, and then I also loved the Hardy Boys, and uh, mm-hmm. they were they were important to me then. And uh, I've, I've managed to amass a collection of them since then. Uh, those kinds of books, any kind of a chapter book, and I read comic books religiously uh, at that age. Yeah. That, I think that's very common about people, uh, you know, who, well, at least it's been common, certainly in our generations, um, about people who get an affinity for Sherlock Holmes. They, In addition to being big readers, you know, they, something about these environments, you know, the Hardy Boys, secret panels, mysterious houses, trying to figure out what's going on and mysteries going from chapter to chapter, feeling very engaged. Um, you know, that tends to be very sticky and that's very Sherlockian. Well, and, and familiar characters that recur over and over again. And so you, you find things that you feel like fit the characters and, and you look forward to seeing that character reappear. And that's mm-hmm. certainly something Conan Doyle almost really originated, I think, in many ways with, with Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. When when did you discover there were other people who uh, had this sort of interest? I went into college, and uh, I was in a bookstore browsing around, and I found Baring Gould Annotated. And uh, I spent it, it cost $35 for a bound two-volume set in a case, which was an enormous amount of money for me. And I think I didn't eat very much for the next week or so because uh, I had spent it all on that book. And when the annotations were great, but what was really more important to me were all those articles, as you know, he has in it. And that revealed to me that there was a whole universe of people that uh, love Sherlock Holmes, that wanted to be a part of it. And I, I thought, well, I'd love to be a part of that that kind of a group. And so that's where I really discovered that there there were a Sherlockian universe out there for me to be a part of. And what was, what was the first... When did you finally contact a scion or meet with other people? Or It was when I was in Washington. I had moved up there to work for uh, then-Senator Gore, uh, Congressman Gore, as a matter of fact, and uh, found the Red Circle of Washington. And that was the first contact I had with other Sherlockians in a group setting. <laughs> there had been a national group, but I didn't know about it before, when I still lived in Middle Tennessee. So... It wasn't until I got to Washington that I got in touch with the uh, Scion group. That's great. Now, uh, given that your uh, given that your um, career took you into uh, not only Washington but uh, the State House at, at Tennessee, tell us about any kinds of uh, overlap that you may have seen between politics and the world of Sherlock Holmes. Well, it, to be honest with you, Scott, it was just the opposite. Uh, what I liked about the Sherlock Holmes groups is that it was <laughs> removed from the political of uh, it, 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 it. That's a stressful business, and it's uh, a contentious business most of the time. The nature of politics is that it, it's a, a competitive and, and aggressive kind of a business, and especially with the people I was working for who had ambitions and were always striving for the next thing. I found Sherlock Holmes to be a refuge from that of people who didn't care what your politics were and I didn't care what theirs were. And so uh, it's, it's been a good thing to, to be able to avoid that kind of partisanship in a, a Sherlockian world where everybody has a common interest that binds us together rather than finds ways usually to uh, put us apart. Although, as you know, there are controversies of our own, but, uh, by and large, I like, love Sherlock Holmes because it got me away from that partisan world. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we, we know that back in the 1940s, uh, Edgar Smith was uh, fairly uh, assertive in approaching certain occupants of the Oval Office. 
and uh, interacting with them about Sherlock Holmes and, and bestowing upon them uh, honorary membership in the Baker Street Irregulars. And this, this of course, is uh, FDR and Harry Truman, uh, both of whom actually um, mention that uh, they obviously had very stressful jobs at a very critical time in uh, American history, and they viewed Sherlock Holmes as a wonderful escape as well. Um, have, did did you run into any uh, fellow uh, politicos who joined you in this escape, or or were you actually alone in your ability to uh, completely leave the office at the office? Well, none of my office mates shared the passion, and uh, so I uh, I didn't really. I mean, of course, in the red circle, there are several people in, in government that are uh, uh, associated with that with that group. So. But, uh, no, I was kind of, it was kind of my own little refuge, uh, away, as I say, away from the, from the daily hubbub of what I was doing at the time. That's great. That's great. Well, you know, uh, we're reminded of Vincent Starrett, who in 1942 or 43, I believe, uh, wrote his famous poem, 221B. And, uh, he said, that age before the world went all awry. Uh, you know, mentioning how uh, here, though the world explode, these two survive, and it's always 1895. It's just a wonderful... And I think that's what binds us all together exactly. on this. It's uh, Starrett was exactly right. I wonder what Starrett think about how the world is awry today. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, every every age has its uh, its, its external uh, concerns. I think uh, it was Bob Tomlin when he was with us all the way back on. Uh, I think episode, oh gosh, 11 maybe? Uh, he read Bill Schweikert's A Long Evening with Holmes, and it was about being able to escape from the rat race. Uh, and, and this world is uh, as close as a book, uh, as near as a page. And, uh, just, just a wonderful sentiment of this, this little form of escapism that we all play. I totally agree. Oh. Well, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, what it is that you've managed to uh, put together, this very creative work uh, that is the, the, the title of our episode, A Homes by Any Other Name. Can, can you describe that for us and, and maybe give us a sense as to why you decided to approach this? Well, I, I did. I was the keynote speaker, the opening speaker at the Misadventures of Sherlock Holmes conference in Minneapolis. And that was an exciting thing to be asked to do. I had kind of suggested the theme of the Misadventures of Sherlock Holmes. And the talk I prepared had four parts. One, I talked about how I came up with the idea for the conference and, and kind of pushed it on the organizers. The second was a history of the book. Ellery Queen's anthology, and the other, the third part was a discussion of the parody names, which produced this book, and the fourth was some actual misadventures Sherlock Holmes had in his uh, in his stories. What people remember is that I had compiled a very long list of, of, of at that time a couple of hundred names, um, about two hundred fifty between two hundred fifty and three hundred names of Sherlock Holmes that. Uh, they're not names of Sherlock Holmes. They're they're puns and derivatives of uh, a linguistic akin to Sherlock Holmes, and uh, read them out uh, all in a list, and it went on for nearly eight minutes. And I managed to do that every time I practiced it. I messed it up, but when it came out that time, it was it was a lot of fun and, and was well received. And so people said, "Oh, I'd like to have a copy of that list." And I thought, well, you know, this the list is fun to look at, and there are a few lists out there that are not as detailed, but what's more fun is to know where those names came from. So I began the process of annotating and looking and discovering uh, other names like that. Uh, the most common, of course, is Herlock Sholmes, and went from there and came up with this book. So in this particular book, I've got 560 derivative names of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> and since that time, I've added about you know 25 more, uh, I guess for the second edition, if it ever appeared. And that's where it came from. And it's been fun. To, 
And as I say in my introduction, I, it was a pleasure to work on, but a relief to bring to a close because you can get obsessed without for looking for the next one. And there's always going to be a next yeah. one. So that's where it came from. Well, how, how did this phenomenon start? I mean, where, where were you able to trace the very first derivative of Sherlock Holmes's name to? Well, that's a, that's a good question. And of course, I have an extensive library and I guess I first started there with all my own copies. Uh, there have been other studies of it. Paul Herbert did the, the sincerest form of flattery where he studied some of these names. Some of them are listed in the misadventures of Sherlock Holmes. The universal Sherlock Holmes is a, uh, is a great resource. Uh, and so I, I, I started studying all of those and found that, uh, parodies first started in 1891, just a few months after Scandal appeared. And the first parody name, Sherwood Hoax came in 1892, at least the first one I can find. Hmm. So uh, it was just a matter of, of matching these up, of finding the names, of finding who wrote them and who derived them, and uh, and then dis- discovering which one was the first, which I think Sherwood Hoax is the first parody name that I can find from 1892. Hmm. A fellow named C.C. C. Rothwell, who wrote under the pseudonym A. Cone and Oil. And so ah. the parody names and puns have been a, a part of it from the beginning. <laughs> That's great. Well, you know, uh, if, if you have attended any of Peter Blau's annual uh, Christmas tree trimmings, Sherlockian tree trimmings, uh, you'll note that he has one ornament for every story, and then he's got a couple of bonus uh, ornaments. And there was one that stumped me, and it was it was a can of oil, with a pine cone uh, attached to it, and that was cone and oil. So <laughs> that's <laughs> that's gratifying to hear that cone and oil was uh, was the very first author, uh, quote unquote, of uh, the Sherlock Holmes uh, name parodies. And that's a good example of a, a good idea being repeated. I mentioned Herlock Sholmes, which is the most obvious parody name, and yeah. related to that is Herlock Sholmes and. I have 30 instances of Herlock Sholmes mentioned in the book and 19 of Herlock Sholmes from the 1890s until just now, the present. And I suspect that every single one of those nearly 50 individuals that cre- thought they were creating a unique name <laughs> that to uh, make, you know, to denote Sherlock Holmes. And it's, uh, it, there's not, plagiarism with it but there's there's good ideas are repeated over and over again and but many of the names in my book is if you'll look through it are just singular they're just one instance that i can huh. find and are, are these are these names typically uh related to some sort of literary effort or do you find them in other iterations as well oh well of course short stories and more short parodies are the usual things, sketches, jokes, and things like that. But you can find them just about anywhere. You can find them in, in of course, we mentioned comic books already earlier, and uh, poetry, advertising. Hmm. Uh, the Internet has produced a lot of different ones. Uh, I even found one in a uh, supermarket flyer. <laughs> and it's just there are there are it's in every say artist or create artistic uh create of their ideas and they produce them in every aspect of of society and culture you can find a parody name of Sherlock Holmes he's so universal in his appeal but he's also universal in his parody now is is the same true for Dr Watson it is not as extensive for Dr. Watson, but there are plenty of Dr. Watson parody names, too, and I, I do do a list of them. And, of course, in the annotation, there's no uh, of avoiding it, and I wouldn't want to avoid it. There's just uh, uh, dozens and dozens of, uh, of Watson parody names as well, and for Moriarty as well. There's an even shorter list, but hmm. uh, they're both names that can be uh, parodied and twisted and turned and Turned into something fun. Bill, do 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 I understand what you just said um, correctly? That the that the very first parody name goes all the way back to a study in Scarlet. After a study in Scarlet came out, 
Uh, well, it goes back to 1892 when, uh, uh, as I say, C.C. Rothwell's first parody name that I could find, Sherwood Hoax, was the, was the first one I could find. So it, just as soon as these stories started to become popular, people started to, to use them in a parody way. <laughs> and, of course, in sometimes Conan Doyle owned the character, and they, if they wanted to write a, a little uh, kind of a pastiche type of a thing, they had to change the name. So, but most of the time in the early years, it was humorous. It was a takeoff. It was a satire or, or a humorous kind of a story, uh, a, a takeoff on Holmes's methods. Um, so it's, uh, it, it wasn't until later years that you saw more series, kind of like Solar Ponds, which is obviously a kind of a, a parody of the name that, that was done by August Derleth, uh, who did a whole long series of stories uh, about uh, his character, which was based on and, and originally intended to be Sherlock Holmes. Um, Charles Hamilton, uh, who wrote under the name Peter Todd, did 93 Sherlock or Herlock Sholmes stories, and they were an immense success in their own right. And that came later later on as well. So they have they have gone they've gone back all the way, Bert, to the very first of the stories when they first started to become popular, and they haven't stopped. They keep coming every every month. There's a new one. Hmm. Now of the of the 560 names that you <laughs> have discovered and um, printed in this book. How many of the actual stories have you read? Have you read 560 <laughs> stories? Uh, because I, if, I if so, you should get some sort of medal for this. <laughs> I've read a lot of them, and doing this book made me read a lot of them, and I had a lot of fun reading them. But no, some of them I've never actually been able to find. I just know about. I've read uh, from other summaries or other stories where what they were. And most of them I have seen in some form or another, but... Almost all of them, but a few of them I've never actually been able to see hmm. see myself. Are there are there any that stand out that that you thought were really clever names or really great characters or particularly, I mean, from a humor standpoint, really funny? What's what's on the hit parade well, for you? <laughs> my my favorite name was Shell Shot Flown, which was uh, found in an illustrious client's news. Uh, publication back in 1984 a guy named Joel Maka who I don't know maybe you do and uh, I think that's the most fun name of all uh, hmm. and so uh, that, that's been the one that I've enjoyed and it's hardest to say too it's just hard to say but I love that uh, I do like uh, Charles Hamilton's uh, Sherlock, uh, Sherlock Sholmes stories they are fun and they're they're interesting um I think those are the two that really kind of stood out for me. Is, is uh, one one the name I like the most, and the other the stories I've enjoyed the most. Hmm. And and have you created any names along the way? Have you have you come <laughs> up with any any of your own spoof names? No. I, when I was doing the, the book, I got to four hundred ninety nine, and I said, "Oh, I got I got stuck." I thought, I need one more. And somebody said, well, just one of my friends here said, just make one up yourself. And I said, no, that that's not fair. That's, that, that won't do it to get to 500. Of course, as you know, I got way above 500. So, no, I haven't tried to, my hand at that yet. I've only ever written really one pastiche. It appears in Pursuing Sherlock Holmes. And I'm more of a essay in writings about the writings kind of a Sherlockian mm-hmm. pastiche or parody producer. You know, I I remember back uh, in my college days when I when I first discovered the Speckled Band of Boston, and I was going to school at Boston University. Um, you know, part of the uh, requirements to become a member of the band was to attend a dinner and then to write a paper. And I wrote a number of papers. Uh, I just happened to be on a tear at the time. And um, I actually wrote so many that the poker of the Speckled Band at the time, Dev D. Gazaldi, sent me a note back saying, Scott, stop your furor scribendi is destroying my Xerox machine. Um, but one of them, because I was involved in a physics class at the time, uh, I, I wrote about Sherlock Ohms, O-H-M-S. Oh, man. and you should have told me that. I would have had it in the... Well, but I, I find that Sherlock Ohms 
uh, is is mentioned. And to me, this is incredibly creative. And 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 you talk about the ways that you know people can can bring Sherlock Holmes into whatever it is that they're doing or their profession, etc. Sherlock Holmes, according to your book. Uh, it appeared in The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, as related by Dr. Watts Ion, uh, anonymous. This was collected in Magico magazine, but it was a collection of 15 short tales that originally appeared in the Anaconda Wire, which was an advertising publication for the Anaconda Copper Company between June 1947 and November 1951. You know, what a creative use of the character for business purposes. Well, and it is. And, you know, the, the, all, the, all, I think it was the author of State Farm Insurance Company did one about Sher- Sherlock Home and uh, about uh, keeping your home locked and keeping it secure. And you're right. I mean, it, it shows where Sherlock really is everywhere. And you can hear of Sherlock everywhere in every kind of business and every kind of context. And, and these parody names, I think if it shows anything, shows that very, very graphically and very importantly. Now, you, you mentioned, you know, maybe being able to create your own. Uh, there, there's actually uh, a, a wonderful list that's tacked on here on page 159. Uh for uh, it, it's the ty- the chapter is titled "Think Up a New Homes," and you say in mm-hmm. the in the K Zone Bulletin of January third, two thousand nine, young readers were invited to quote "Think Up a New Homes." The bulletin and accompanying blog are online publications of K Zone, where kids rule, produced by Summit Media of the Philippines, uh, and they had various uh, parodies of the the Sherlock Holmes story. So the the editors asked the readers to come up with their own list of uh, Sherlockian uh, parodied names, and, and they, they use the formula Blank Lock Holmes. And, and you know, they're, they're cute uh, suggestions because these are kids, obviously, but how many did they end up coming up with out of that particular publication? Golly, I did not, answer, I did not count them, but there's four, four pages full of them, and these kids were very creative. Of course, like I say in the book it's some of them are grown worthy because they're <laughs> they're uh they're kids and coming up with stuff but it's some of them have seen other places like fablock holmes the fashion designer or roarlock holmes the dinosaur expert and they these kids were very creative and children's minds are so inventive and they have such great imaginations and and that i thought that was just such a wonderful little website that i stumbled upon as i was doing the research that maybe each one of their little creations didn't deserve a full entry in the, in the main part of the book, but I thought they they deserved to be recognized for what they came up with. Yeah. So I'll have to say, anybody out there who's wanting to come up with an original Sherlock Holmes parody name uh, is going to have a hard time coming up with something totally original, but <laughs> I suspect they can if they try. Well, here, here's, a, here's a challenge to our listeners. Uh, if you think you have it in you, uh, send us an email or, or leave a comment on the show notes here. Uh, again, the email is comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. The show notes are available at iHose.co slash iHose168. Uh, leave us a comment there with your own version of a Sherlock Holmes parody name. And I think what we'll do, in addition to the quiz this episode, we will award uh, a, a prize to what we think, and, and we'll use Bill as as, uh, as a judge in this, what we think is the most creative name. So <laughs> have at it. And, and while you're at it, make sure you pick up a copy of uh, a Holmes by any other name from Wildside Press. We will have a link to... <clears throat> to this book in the show notes as well, uh, where you can, you know, kind of test yourself against the names that are already out there. Now, just after the break, we'll continue the conversation with Bill about another publication. So stick with us. A few years ago, Bert and I participated in the Great Sherlock Holmes debate that was in support of MX Publishing and Undershaw. Well, the Great Sherlock Holmes debate is back for 2019 and is taking place at Undershaw and online on May 25th. We have a link in the show notes to the Eventbrite page where you can register. It's a special event 
that is being hosted at Undershaw and will be streaming live worldwide online. 100 guests will join in person and 400 additional tickets will be available for fans to view anywhere in the world. It begins at 6.45 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, that's 2.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and flies into high gear uh, at the top of the hour with an exhibit for the art of Sherlock Holmes, live from the Ann Norton Studios in West Palm Beach. It's an exclusive first look at art that is supporting Sherlock Holmes and 15 different artists and their work. So uh, the half hour leading up to the great Sherlock Holmes debate will be contained uh, in that view of the art at the art gallery. And then the debate at 7.30 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, uh, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time will give us the great Sherlock Holmes debate. Have we gone too far? Sherlock Holmes, of course, holds the record for uh, the character most portrayed on the screen, but have we gone too far making him into things like oh, a mouse, uh, a, uh, a 21st century drug addict, uh, a woman, a Pokemon, Will Ferrell's iteration? The participants include, the debaters include Lindsay Fay, Bonnie McBird, Amy Thomas, Matthias Bostrom, Roger Johnson, Jay Ganguly, uh, Mary Platt, Dan Andriaco, Derek Belanger, Janina Woods, and many other leading Sherlockians. So tune in. Check it out at eventbrite.com. Uh, we'll have the link in the show notes. And get yourself registered to participate in the Great Sherlock Holmes Debate 2019. Bill, in addition to your uh, pursuit of pastiche names for Sherlock Holmes, you have also put together a book called Pursuing Sherlock Holmes, which, as you pointed out earlier, is really more your line of thinking when you prefer to do essays about Sherlock Holmes. And you cover so many different things here, sex and sadism and the Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, trios, groups of three in the Sherlockian canon and so on. Tell us a little bit about this book. When did you, what, when did you first write your uh, first Holmesian essay? Well, the first Holmesian essay of any import was uh, Deeper Shades, which appears in this book, The Dressing Gowns of Sherlock Holmes and the Psychology of Color. I produced it as a monograph back in the 1990s, and it was a study of the, shirt, the dressing gowns that Sherlock Holmes had worn, why he wore them, and what effect those dressing gowns had upon him. I, the thesis is is that the different colors had a different psychological effect on Sherlock Holmes, and that was the first very major kind of a essay I had done. I was pretty proud of it. Sent it out, and uh, it was did 221 copies of it, as was the standard and the norm, and. It was the first thing I did. After that, I began to be asked to do presentations at different conferences or to write uh, essays for different publications, especially the old Holmes and Watson report that came out of Peoria, Illinois, that Brad Kefalter did, but also several other publications. And so I decided at some point that I would assemble some of the ones that I liked best and thought were the best and put them into this book, and I produced that uh, produced this book and have been, you know, it's done very well, I think, for for our kind of publication in our little universe. And so that's that was the first one I did. And I have I especially love doing presentations at conferences. I love conferences. I think the very best of the Sherlockian world. It, they're like little family reunions wherever you go. And uh, I've been fortunate to be asked to uh, to speak several times and those uh talks lead into uh into articles, and, and one of them that I did at Dayton, I turned into an article and wound up winning the uh, Morley Montgomery Award with it uh, in 2016. So uh, I, I like writing. I think that's that's, and I like making presentations. <laughs> tell tell us about the Morley Montgomery Award. Well, it was a uh, 
a story about looking to Latin America and finding Latin American influences on the Sherlock Holmes stories. And he had written uh, a what was called an introduction to a, a book called The Fair Land of Central America. And actually, he wrote a letter about it, and the author took it and used it as a as a uh, introduction. But the uh, the Fair Land of Central America actually he must have read it actually in the actual French. The French it was a French publication. Conan Doyle, as you know, spoke French and translated from it himself. And I think some of those influences showed up in his stories. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of Latin American references in canon, but that. The ones that were there, I think I've tried to find a connection there. So that was a, that was, that is not in pursuing Sherlock Holmes. Of course, that came later after the book had been published. Hmm. And, and for our listeners, just so you know, the Morley Montgomery Award is the award that is bestowed by the editors of the Baker Street Journal for what is considered the best article in the Baker Street Journal from that particular year. You know, an exciting an exciting thing to win. It 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 absolutely is and it's uh, it's an uncommon thing. So congratulations on that, Bill. Thank you. Um you know, <laughs> one one of the fun parts of this book uh, and th- there are so many different uh types of uh of of contributions of of, of articles here. There there are toasts, there are our scholarly papers, lots of fun things. But, you know, when I get to the back of the book, uh, I, I look at the notes in the cases and they're, they're separated by, uh, by chapter, you know, so, so particular notes are going, uh, with the appropriate essay. But you can, o- you can open this book to the notes page and get a sense as to Bill's eclectic sense of humor and of uh, of knowledge because the the notes range from uh, mentions of young frankenstein to uh, the nutty professor and lurch from the adams family uh, boy george and david bowie um oh, what else do we have the reckless rock star madonna um <laughs> catholic doctrine i mean you know the the notes alone give you a sense as to how we hear of Sherlock everywhere and and how wide your interests are, uh, Bill. That must have been a lot of fun. Well, it was a lot of fun, and, and and I didn't realize until I started assembling all these different talks and articles that I had done that that it did do such a wide range of things. But you know, I hear of Sherlock everywhere is a real thing, I and mean, it's it's a real thing in society and literature and. And in popular culture, and you can and you can find the connection, uh, and real connections, and not just convoluted or strained ones, and, and just about everywhere you look, and especially once our minds are attuned to it. And and I and I I'm glad you see that this book tried to to make that connection throughout society. Yeah, you know, as as Bert and I were talking about preparing for our interview with you. Um, you know, obviously, a Holmes by any other name, it's a very specific kind of book, very, very uh, singular topic, obviously a very unique kind of uh, topic. But when we got to pursuing Sherlock Holmes, we found that it's really, it's almost a microcosm of how Sherlock Holmes affects different areas of the world or how we, I should restate that, how we take different areas of the world and apply it to uh, the Sherlockian canon. Uh, and you know, this is uncommon with certain authors because usually Sherlockians have a swim lane, if you will, uh, where, whereas they can, they can take an interest that they might have in, oh, I don't know, uh, pocket watches or, uh, collectible pens or railroads. And that's their thing. You know, that, that's what they're known for and that's what they stick to. But you're really a, a, a polyglot when it comes to Sherlock Holmes, aren't you? Well, I am, and there's a lot of interest in life, and and I think you can get focused on too too singular an idea, and and really miss out on a lot of other things in life. And mm. uh, so I've tried to take my whole gamut of the things I'm interested in, whether it's movies or books or or classic literature or or, or popular ideas, and and time into Sherlock Holmes, hopefully in a fun way, in a humorous way. 
And I've got to imagine that having that wide range of interests and, you know, being as well versed as you are brings you, uh, into, into touch with a lot of different kinds of people, uh, in the, in the Sherlockian world. Um, you, you want to talk a little bit about, about that? Maybe the types of people that you've encountered and where you get your, uh, your, your, your energy, where you get your batteries recharged in the Sherlockian world? Well, I think I mentioned earlier how much I like these conferences, and that's the place to go to get your batteries recharged. And, and of course, the birthday weekend's fun, but even more so as far as ideas, exchange, exchanging ideas and coming up with new ideas or, or conferences and, and, and get-togethers. The Scion meetings as well. Uh, I love the Minneapolis group uh, so much. I'm going to be able to be there later this year uh, for the next conference. And uh, But Dayton, and uh, I've gone all over the country for, for conferences. I think the first conference I did was in Santa Fe. And it, it, that's the place to go. You meet all sorts of people. And, and there isn't a subject you can name of any kind in science, in literature, in medicine, that you can't find a Sherlockian who's well-versed on that and who can turn that into a Sherlockian connection and can give you the kind of resources you need if you give them a call to uh, ask them about it, to connect whatever you're trying to do. And that's that's the great thing about it. Tom Sticks always said Sherlock Holmes was about people, and mm. uh, that was the most important thing. And I, I think he was right uh, about that. Yeah. There's there's such a wide range of people, and, and you know, wealthy and poor and uh, uh, knowledgeable in some area. Uh, like you mentioned earlier, some people have such a specific area of expertise, and and whenever I've asked a Sherlockian for help on research or an idea, they, they're always, they've never had anybody not willing to share that and, mm. and be enthusiastically doing so. How wonderful. So, uh, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the fresh rashers of Nashville. That's a new one to me. <laughs> well, well, the fresh rashers is a, a group that meets every Friday morning at a Nashville restaurant and we've, we've, We've outlasted three or four that have closed down on us. We've had to move. And, uh, right now we're meeting in a place called Wendell Smith's and on Charlotte Avenue in Nashville. But, uh, we, we meet every Friday morning. There's always Sherlockian content, of course, but there's also just a sharing of what's going on in life in general with us. Uh, we decided that we would go ahead and make it a Scion Society back in 2000. Hmm. And, uh, so, and it's, it's been meeting weekly since then, except on a holiday. And we, uh, we are a specific group of Sherlockians. Uh, I think most of us or all of us are also part of the Nashville Scholars, but our major activity through the, in the year is coming up later this month is to go to Shannon Carlisle's school. Shannon is a, a Baker Street Irregular and a Sherlockian school teacher who has her classroom set up as 221B. Right. And we play redheaded Jeopardy with her students who are gifted <laughs> students and they beat us every time. Wow. We have no chance against her students and that's our major outing of the year, but we also have camaraderie and Sherlockian discussion every Friday morning and it's not many groups I think that can meet weekly and, and be able to do that. And we do it. That's that's wonderful. How how big a group? How many of you gather for breakfast? It ranges it ranges from uh, four or five, and we have had as many as ten or eleven. And uh, that's that's uh, to get people at seven o'clock in the morning at a at a restaurant in Nashville is uh, is a challenge. But I think we manage to do it almost every week. Now, are you actually eating bacon? Are there really rashers? <laughs> There are really rashers, and some of us eat bacon, and some of us try to avoid the, the fatty meat. But uh, yes, there is. And the places we meet in Nashville are, are old-fashioned, meat three, uh, old-fashioned breakfast type of places. So uh, there's there's plenty of bacon if you want it. Oh, that's it's great that because, because there may be you know a parallel group here of uh, the cholesterol confusion that could be pursuing the <laughs> <laughs> the fresh rashers just in the interests of maintaining their health. I, uh, well, I, I think that's where the Jefferson Hope Society comes in for those who suffer from heart, heart ailments, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
when we've had our share, Billy Seals wants a uh, hot chicken, Nashville hot chicken for breakfast, and he wound up in the hospital later that day. So <laughs> oh. <laughs> you have to be careful about what you do. Good Lord. Oh. Wow. Well, Bill Mason, this has been a fascinating conversation, and, and you uh, yourself are a fascinating Sherlockian. So thank you very much for sharing your story with us. Well, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate you having me here, and I appreciate uh, all your kind words. The books, again, are Pursuing Sherlock Holmes, available from Ex Libris, and A Holmes by Any Other Name from Wildside Press. We'll have links to both of those in the show notes, so you can take a look and pursue them yourself. Bill, thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. What a lot of fun to talk to Bill. You know, he's a wonderful conversationalist, and we've had some great conversations with him over the years. But also, I, I opened up Pursuing Sherlock Holmes, and I think we should have talked about this with Bill because I think there's an honor here. He really – there should be some sort of competition for the best first sentence for a Sherlockian essay <laughs> or the most intriguing first sentence in a Sherlockian essay. And here's one from Bill's book, uh, the first sentence for one of his essays on page 85 of Pursuing Sherlock Holmes. He writes, Sherlock Holmes is described in detail throughout the canon, but his chin, though frequently mentioned, is mentioned only sparingly. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's great. Isn't that a hoot? That is great. I like that. I mean, and this just sparks so many things that, uh, you know, we could do. I mean, I could write, um, of all the articles of clothing mentioned in the adventures of Sherlock Holmes, I've not been able to find a single reference to socks. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, our other show, Trifles, which uh, airs every week, We're always looking for topics to help fuel our conversation there. And and on the surface, it wouldn't seem as if you can run out of topics to discuss about Sherlock Holmes. I mean, look, we've we've noted that the Baker Street Journal has been in almost constant uh, publication since 1946 and doesn't appear to be in danger of slowing down anytime soon. Um, However... We could use some of the topics in pursuing homes as uh, fuel for our trifling conversations over on uh, trifles, no doubt, Uh, because Bill just offers a a wide variety. You know, I I look toward uh, the back of the book, toward one of the final essays, and he talks about characters that may or may not be dead as we leave them. (laughs) In the canon, you know, the, the the ending was left maybe questionable, and there was no body found, for example. So, could they make a reappearance at some time? And that, that that's a fascinating topic, right there. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's yeah, there's just it's just, there's just no end. Gum in the canon. <laughs> Holmes habits. I'm sure someone's written about this. You know, was Holmes a regular toothbrusher? I mean, what were his dental hygiene habits, particularly after he lost that left canine? Well, that, that's a great point. All that smoking. There you go. Well, he, he did recommend that Watson bring a toothbrush on the adventure of the Speckled Band. Oh, right. There you are. There you are. What do we know about that toothbrush and who manufactured it? Was it was in Ely's number two, wasn't Oh, no, wait. That was the gun. <laughs> and, of course, as many names as there have been for Holmes over the course of the years, there have also been plenty of commentaries about Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle in the newspapers. And here to bring us his regular feature as we go to press is Matthias Bostrom. The press is a very valuable institution if one knows how to use it. Read all about it. Telegraph! Westminster murder! Read all about it. Telegraph! Read all about it. Westminster murder! I must make something of it. 
Although I've no doubt that every newspaper in London will be on the street with a full and detailed account. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. This is As We Go to Press with Matthias Bostrom. There's something funny with Sherlock Holmes. And I mean funny. This time the random date generator gave me 11th of August 1938. I searched the newspaper archives and found a column in the Ogden Standard Examiner from Utah. The column is called Sunshine and Shadow and gives some amusing comments on the weather and ends with a P.S. I'll read it to you. Sherlock says, Ah, Watson, I see you have put on your winter underwear. Watson Marvellous, Holmes. How did you deduce that? Sherlock. Well, you have forgotten to put on your trousers. Long before the famous tent joke, there were other Sherlock Holmes jokes, and one of the most long-living ones is this one. You can still see it now and then, but it was maybe most popular in the mid-twentieth century, uh, from the 1930s to the 1960s. The oldest appearance I've found was spread in U.S. newspapers during 1931. In that one, Sherlock Holmes says, Ah, Watson, I see you changed your underwear. I think that version is slightly funnier than the winter underwear one. During the following years... When the joke was published in the newspapers, they seemed to have preferred the, the winter underwear version during winter time and changing it to summer underwear during summer time. Then the joke evolved further with Sherlock Holmes sipping his whiskey and soda while making the observation. And finally, I found another version in Canada in the Winnipeg Tribune from 1937. Sherlock Holmes says, Ah, Watson, I see you are still wearing your heaviest underwear. Watson says, Marvellous, Holmes, marvellous. How did you ever deduce that? Sherlock again, Principally by the fact that you have forgotten to put on your trousers. It would be interesting to learn more about the history of Sherlock Holmes' jokes. Let's see what we can find in future episodes. And that dulcet tone can mean only one thing. It's time to test your wits once again, or your wit, depending on how few you have, at the Canonical Couplets Quiz. Now, if you recall, the last time around, we put this canonical couplet in front of you. Cooey! A most extraordinary noise seems to identify Australian boys. Bert, do you know which story that refers to? Uh, that is the... <laughs> That's Isn't that the speckled koala? <laughs> Um, that would have been funny to see a speckled koala wrapped around Grimsby Roylet's head when they walked in um, at the end of that story. No, that is the Boscombe Valley mystery. Oh, of course. Yes, yes, yes. And we had a number of entries uh, this time around. And once again, we'll have to spin our prize wheel. Here it goes. And as it uh, goes around here, it slows down a bit. Landing on... Lucky number 15. All right, and that gets us to Rich Criscunis. Rich, met you at uh, Dayton. I hope I'll see you again very shortly at the Amateur Mendicant Society meeting where I can bring your prize. Congratulations. Now, if you would like to join Rich as a potential prize winner, here's how to do it. This week's canonical couplet is as follows. The best and wisest man I ever knew still had, apparently, a trick or two. 
If you think you know the answer to this canonical couplet, jot it down in an email. Send it to us at comment that I hear of Sherlock.com with the subject line canonical couplet. If we choose your name from random out of all of the correct entries, you can win a prize. Good luck. Oh, it's so exciting. I can hear people all across the country uh, getting out their number two pencils, <laughs> finding some extra pieces of paper, trying to figure out the answer to that canonical couplet. Scribble, scribble. I know. Yep. We, let's see. I, I, I think it's another easy one this time around. So hopefully we'll have uh, a lot of entries again. So I hope we I hope we hear from folks. Well, I think we have just about done it here this time around as we turn the page on another episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Until next time, this is the appropriately named Scott Monty. And I am Split Lip Moans. <laughs> and together we say the, the games of foot. foot. <laughs> the, the games of foot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.